Joe, he was a young cord wangler, munging grievals did he go. And he loved a bogler's daughter by the name of Chiswick Flo. Vain she was, and like a grusset, and her gander parts were fine. But she sneered at his cord wangle as it hung upon the line. So he stole a woggler's moolie for to make a wedding ring. But the Bow Street runners caught him, and the judge said, You will swing. Oh, oh, they hung him by the postern, nailed his moolie to the fence. Or to warn all young cord wanglers that it was a grave offence. Here's the moral to this story, though your cord wangler be poor, keep your hands off others' moolies, for it is against the law. Two whiffs of that and you're greedy. Who is it? Who do you think it is? I don't know. Could be anyone. Well, it ain't. It's me. Don't play a silly bugger. Open up. What do you want, Louie? How are you? Same as I was this morning. Where have you been? Nowhere. Nowhere? Hospital. I'll tell you later. My kettle's on the boil. What are you doing to eat him? Are you eating tonight? What have you got, me? What do you want? Omelette. Spanish. I'm all out of small veg. What do you ask me for, then? I could open a tin of some sort. A tin? What do you do all day? I don't remember. This and that. Well, you want to do less of this and more of that? No veg. It's a disgrace. Well, I'll make you a cheese omelette, then. <sighs> if I can digest it. And what time are you coming round, then? The usual. Oh, good. We will watch the telly together. You choose. Well, there'll be nothing on. Never is. Positively massive it is. Well, if you need any help filling it, you're all that is. Give me a bell. Ta ra! <laughs> Ta ra, mate! <laughs> Plebeians. Expecting me to behave like that is positively a disgrace.
diaries are written so that one has a record of events and because there are certain events one wants to remember. There is perhaps also the element of the confessional. That's what is so delightful. It's what the self wants to say. I've done a lovely job. <laughs> you got to have a trade, boy. You take it from me. There's no point in dreaming your way through life. It's ironic that in so many ways I resembled my father. We're alike in so many things. Both of us share a sense of inferiority. Mark my words, son. Hair. It always needs doing. You've got to have a trade. Hair, it always needs doing. Shh. The old man will hear you. You've got to have a trade, boy. A trade. Take no notice of him. He's a man, not like us. <laughs> Look, Kelly, it's finished. What sort of hell is that? It's a dress. Who for? Who do you think? Me. Kenneth Williams, with his mincing step and comical demeanour as Angelica, was a firm favourite with a school audience to whom his snobbishness and pert vivacity made great appeal. Now what you got to say? He looks like a girl. He looks nothing like a girl. I do not look like a girl. What do you look like then? A princess. Oh Vanish! Would not have missed military service for the world. Marvellous. Learn about torpedoes. Very interesting. Joining the entertainment corps opened my eyes to many possibilities. That's for sure. I wrote to the stage newspaper today, asking them to insert the following advertisement. Rep work required by experienced male actor, age 22, height 5 foot 9 inches, retentive memory, many different voices. Unnatural performer. Ever since I left you, Sybil, my life has been intolerable. I am wretched, utterly wretched. I feel as if... as if... Hmm. What is the matter, Kenneth? I forgot it, didn't I? I'm awfully sorry. <laughs> if you fluff a line, dear boy, make it up until you find your place. Never let the audience know where you went wrong. Never remove your mask, understand? Yes, well, yes, that's correct, you see, yes. Never, I tell you, never. Ever since I left you, Sybil, my life has been intolerable, utterly intolerable and wretched. Oh, wretched. And yes, oh, wretched. Bloody hell. You've never seen such Tell me I'm dreaming. I can tell you now. Well, if you're not there, I yes, certainly right. am. I am. I am wretched. 
The City and the Pillar is a book I should not care to have missed for the world. There is a strange, wholesome quality to the character of Jim. For the first time, I read about that thing called queerness in what seems to be a thoroughly truthful light. End audition in West End on Friday luck, for Stratford on Avon. Shakespeare. Perhaps he is the answer to my dreams. But break my heart, for I must hold my tongue. Crapola that's talked about something being just around the corner really eats into one's heart. And I marvel at my ability to put up with it. I am now so utterly superior to those around me. Yet, will anybody care to notice? Poking your nose into posh books won't help you find a decent job. And where would you have me poke my nose, pro? Don't use that plummy voice on me. You want to give it up? Give what up? Whatever he gets up to with pansies and whores. I thank you for the advice, Father. Both spiritual and theatrical. Nonsense. My Ken is unique. And don't you ever forget it. Your Majesty is anointed king at last. Arts Theatre London, Bernard Shaw St. Joe. Mr. Kenneth Williams is a brilliantly fussy doe fan. A skinny and abandoned lapdog, he will go far. I'm impressed. A classical actor. Good. Because that's exactly what I need. A legit thespian with no funny voices. Ladies and gentlemen, we present Hancock's Half Hour. Good morning. Good morning, Cheeky. Wanna come to the pictures with me? No, op it, op it. Go on, get out of it. Go on, go on. Don't be like that. I saw you wink at me. I didn't wink at you. Before Tyler popped out. <laughs> Don't mess with them bells. Buzz off, buzz off, op it. I think you're smashing. I'll smash you in a minute. <laughs> See, I like yours a bit. <laughs> Where's my bleeding supper?
a disaster feels imminent. It seems as if their whole marriage is cracking up like some jerry-built house. But then I can't remember it any other way. Why does she stick with him? He's so emotionally inadequate in every way. He still insists on this heavy-handed cock-of-the-walk stuff, which of course is hot air and sickening, because underneath he's just like me, always vying for her affections. When will the scales fall from his eyes? The day I was born, Charlie wasn't needed anymore. He'd served his purpose. Lily has me now. Manners. Uh. Pig! Oh, no, it's him again. Only at this juncture of my professional life can I state my worth as a human being. Because I see that in art is man striving for the truth, for order, for the sense which has evaded him in the stupidity of existence. Only in recognition of this truth in art can my respect be commanded. He has me in stitches. <laughs> oh, look at that. It's our new 17-inch console, madam. I'd have thought 17 inches would be enough to console anyone. <laughs> What's going on? Installing a television set. Television set? I didn't purchase any television. You didn't, but Kenny did. It's a present. A gift from me to my father. It's a waste of money. My Kenny can afford it. <gasps> if I'm not sharing with her, who am I sharing with? Good evening. <laughs> what do you want? I'm your roommate. No, no, you're not. No, come on. Stop messing with me. The show went very well tonight, Tony, don't you think? For some of us, it did. The audience were wonderful. <laughs> Not bad. Why the funny voices? I beg your pardon? All this. You have four voices. Your snide's not messing about. Your plummy voice. Your upper-class twit and your cockney. And that's about it, ain't it? A great range for a classical actor, don't you think? Yes, well, the audience look forward to my voices, don't they? Very popular. Of course, playing to the gallery. Any clown could do that. Any cheap comic. Audiences need to be nourished on something pure, Kenny, and we have to teach them. Take them to a higher plane of laughter. The comic potential of a man is infinite, Kenny. Infinite. And so is my bum old Tony. See, I think what an audience wants is to be beguiled. As Shaw once said, and I have appeared in Shaw, an actor must illuminate the dark corners of the mind. I think if you engage them, they will accept it, totally, whatever the manner in which you are playing. After all, comedy and tragedy are only two sides of the same coin. However broad the performance might be, an audience will come with you. If they believe you, they'll say, is it any good? And do I believe? If not, you don't. It's a terrible risk you take being a performer, a tightrope walk, and you take that risk nightly. Don't you agree, Tony? Quite. Yeah, so -so. I'll have your melon balls, followed by the creamed chicken. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Oh, really nice, Peter. Really nice manner. Thank you, lovely boys. <laughs> Say hello to the agent, Ducky. Thanks. Do you have to, Kenneth? Have to what, Peter? Talk so loud, the whole restaurant can hear you. Can they? <gasps> oh, well, they shouldn't be listening. <laughs> Yeah, I expect they probably recognise me from appearing on the television. Not for much longer, I'm afraid. Oh, how do you mean? I've heard a word from the BBC. They want to cut back your characters. He says you're a grotesque. A grotesque? Who did the slur? Hancock did. They want to make the show more realistic, less of a cartoon. 
He doesn't think you're natural enough for his show. I sing. I'm sorry. Well, of course, I'm not natural. I'm supernatural, I am. I am. I'm surreal, Peter. I am. I'm surreal. <laughs> the leaf that blossoms, dies and falls from the tree is in the falling tragic. But I am the leaf that has not yet blossomed. I am that blighted leaf. My tragedy lies in the knowledge of my failure to bloom. I come always near, but never into truth. Is like other people collect stamps. Do you, in fact, borrow them from people that you've met, or do you just pluck them from the air? Oh, yes, they are taken from people I've known, pinched, I suppose. <laughs> the snide voice, the stop messing by one, that was taken from a boy I met, a boy who worked at the Mint, and he was describing how you were searched to make sure you hadn't lift, uh, taken anything that you, um, you shouldn't have. And he was describing with a perpetual smile on his face. Mm -hmm. And then... You gotta be very careful when you say because otherwise they um they make you take your clothes off. So I thought that was a very good idea. The voice, I mean. Not him taking off his clothes. Of course. Indeed. But all my talk on television, I still haven't matured in any real way. Sexually I'm as juvenile as ever, and unresolved. Given a sign, I would act on it, but no sign ever comes. Thank you for the drink. Don't mention it. My pleasure. Would you like another one? Uh, no. Peanut. Perhaps later. Afterwards. Yes. Might I use your lavatory? Uh, nobody is ever allowed to use my lavatory. My lavatory and its paper are my own. Oh. Hygiene.
When did you last scrub those nails? Sorry? Your nails? Such dirt. I don't remember. No, well, you should. Positively filthy. Shall we go somewhere else? Yes, I think you should leave. I think the people who manifest their love for you physically when they know your lack of reciprocation are abominably selfish. All this touching and kissing, which seems so popular among others, passes me by. My friends know I'm a virgin and say I make up for it by flirting. To them, everyone must do something or die. Perhaps I am dead. Already. Celibacy is an essential quality in my own character. I must never allow myself to be vulnerable in the sexual sense. That kind of humiliation would be detrimental in every way. The dirt. Obviously, the sex life of consenting adults of the same sex has nothing to do with anyone else. And the present law is so primitively barbaric that it gives rise to more trouble than it's worth. to say that matches were made in heaven. Nowadays, they're more likely to be made by computer. And a firm has recently opened called Bona Soulmates, who've offered to do it electronically. And I decided to pay them a visit. Hello, anybody there? Oh, hello, I'm Julie, and this is my friend Sandy. Oh, hello, yes, hello, Mr. Orne. We're your Bona Soulmates, we are. Yes, our motto is, for every Omi, there's a Palo. Hello. Yes. We guarantee to match you with the perfect partner. A uh, sort of marriage bureau, eh? Well, what we actually do is, to find you the perfect partner, is we fill in your particulars. Yes, we fill them in, you see. First, we've got to get the essential data. Would you mind answering a few questions, Mr. Orne? <laughs> I don't mind. Well, these questions, you see, they're worked out by a psychiatrist to determine your personality. Yes, now, first of all, what sort of car do you drive, Mr. Orn? Oh, what's that got to do with it? Oh, a car is your sort of virility symbol. Yeah, it sort of indicates the sort of person you are. Yes, for instance, Sean Connery, he drives a great big powerful sports car. Very butch, very potent. What do you drive? A mini. <laughs> I think that tells us all we need to know, Mr. All Orn. we need to know. I got the 73 up to the Angel today and called on Joe Orton, playwright, and his friend. He was frugal, to say the least. Would you care for a ham sandwich, Mr. Williams? Thank you. Ken made them especially. I make all the food around here. While I write plays. Who does your decor? Ken does. They're collages. Art. Oh. Two artists living under the same small roof. Must cramp its style. We like it this way. Ever so cosy. Has been for years. This ham is rather good, don't you think? Isn't it? I do love your new play, Joe. Funeral games. Loot. Sorry? I've changed the title. I think up all the Joe's titles. That's very good, Joe. Outrageous, man. I'm flattered. He is, often nowadays, by all sorts.
Who's your favourite, Mr. Williams? I prefer Miss July. I would like very much to have been born handsome, not for its own sake, but for the sake of being attractive to others. I've no doubt that this is one superficial excuse for more profound complaints within. So much is because I think my face and body unprepossessing. This is, of course, the paradox of my own nature. The thing that I am being the thing which I despise. But I think my despite is justified. <laughs> Same joke for the makeup artist. Oh, yeah, yourself, Charlie. Mm -hmm. This Roman tunic I'm wearing in the film feels me is really quite sexual, don't you think, Joan? Better you, Kenny. Mm. Hail Caesar. Oh, Kenny, not again. Put it away. <laughs> I didn't see a cock the whole time I was in Leicester. Really? No, except my own, and that glimpsed only briefly in a cracked mirror. Oh, I've made Abby in my mirror. Masturbation? The Barclays, yes. Barclays? Barclays Bank. Wang. Can't be right. Oh, I see. A mental cock, I leave it alone. Nothing can touch my fantasies. Positively lewd at times, my mind's eye. We're going to Morocco for it. Bum. Well, Tangier is certainly the place for relaxation during a mild winter. You should come. I don't think your Kenneth would approve, mm, do you? More the merrier, I say. Yes, but does he? I'm over 21, you know. Only in a bad light. Today you could play a boy of sweet 16. Mm, good. Mm. Mm. You are looking up, you do. I already have been, Kenny. How shocking. She will be with her pants down and her tie wrapped around her ankle. I can't say I approve. And not many people do. That's what made the prospect of having him all the more entertaining. No, it's irreligious and immoral. Like my play, hey? Yes. Certainly audiences will be mortally offended should I appear. You're going to do it, then? Luke went down as feared it would. Shocked the audience to buggery. Joe's not here, he's gone out. No. Yeah. Hiding from me, is he? When. When do you expect him back? It depends on what he finds. Now I'll come in. I'm doing Herrick. Oh, for tea, lovely. There isn't enough for three. Rubbish. After what I've been through in that play of his, I deserve fresh salmon. There's something different about you today, Kenny. Oh, Joe bought it for me. <laughs> he said it suited me. More virile. Oh, very distinguished. You like it? It doesn't matter what I think. Uh, Hollandaise sauce? Oh, just a smidgen. The stomach's playing up. 
I could blow off like the wind. <laughs> Thanks for sharing that with me. Thank you. Joe's having trouble with his dick. He uh, wants a good doctor. His aunt's in the right place. Shame his dick isn't. <laughs> well, I'm sure he would never leave you. Joe told me. You've been through too much together, he said. A very magnanimous of him. I'd be grateful for that. Grateful? Some kind of love. He has an inability to love. A horror of involvement. He needs to be utterly free to write, he says. But you can't live without love. Love is involvement. When I'm not indulged, loved by an audience, I always feel the need to run. Where do you run to? Oh, I've no idea. To a friend's habitat, I suppose. Share a bit of our duck, eh? <laughs> bit of our duck, eh? Quite. Quite. What you need out of life, Kenny, is a good fuck up the arse. Really? I should say so. Why? Would that have helped me to perform any better in your play, Joe? It might. Farce is very close to tragedy. Is that how you see me? A tragedy? No. Do you? That fellow's got his own. Where? Over there. No, I won't indulge, Joe. Why not? A promiscuous sex. I've always equated it with... What? Sin. <laughs> Bother! I think the natural goodness and dignity of man is bound up with regard to certain qualities. It's not like the Oxford and, Dictionary. And if you use someone else physically with no other motive but sexual stimulus, then you degrade them. You take away their natural goodness and dignity, and of course your own. Filth fires the soul. Bend over, Kenny. Stretch your toes a little before it's too late. You play at your games, Joe, and I'll play at mine. What do we, any of us, have but our illusions? And what do we ask of others but that we be allowed to keep them? Somerset more. Is that right? Yes, it's one of the secrets of celibacy. The preservation of the illusion. Don't you think? I'll tell you what I think. Nice ass, pert and juicy. Joe Walton. Nippy, isn't it? I hoovered the carpet in the lounge dressed only in bathing trunks. It was very daring. And the atmosphere was charged with sex. If anyone had walked in, they would have been irresistibly attracted. What do you want? What? 
I just passed in and I thought I'd call to see you. Why? You've never called before? Just being friendly. <laughs> Go away! Well, don't be like that. I don't want to see you! Kenny? It's too late to call! I won't forget this! Me neither. When I got home from the theatre, I discovered a small thing crawling on my sheets. It was panic stations. I put it into DDT, watched it die, then sprayed the entire room, the bed, the mattress, the frame, the linen, everything with DDT. God knows what the thing was or where it came from. <laughs> The horror, nonetheless. <laughs> oh, this is Williams. She likes you. No, no, I've relegated my desires, locked them up for good. I don't want to mar my public image, you see. I want the public's plaudits, it's not its opprobrium. Arsons? No, I just put it all into the theatre. That's enough for me. It's where I belong. Yes, Auntie. Good night, Sid. Did you manage a wank? Oh, oh. <laughs> the fame and fortune isn't bad either. Oh, yes. The best thing I did for anyone all year was to buy Louis that fur coat. A Siberian squirrel. Mm. <laughs> she does look lovely in it, though, doesn't she? <laughs> <laughs> Kenny. What's the matter with you? Uh, nothing the matter with me. It's your father. He swallowed some poison. Cleaning fluid. What's he done that for? I'll keep it in the bathroom cabinet. A G's linked to a bottle in case of emergencies. He had a dry, tickly cough and he reached out for some quick relief. Silly sod. Will he live? Well, he seems a peaky colour, don't he? Never so sorry, Louis, about Charlie. Yeah. Thanks, Joan. Terrible, isn't it? He kept saying, take these knives out of my stomach. Oh, dear. Still, it was a rat trap of a marriage. The doctor told Louis his brain was damaged. Mm. The heart was impaired and his kidneys in very bad condition. In reality, it was a good thing, his death. Pass the butter. He'd never have recovered, would he, Louis? No. Not after swallowing poison. Almost a vegetable. No. No. The show went very well tonight, don't you think? Yes. Audience very appreciative of me. Oh, they loved you. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. I thought the second half was fantastic. Louis is to move into the flat next door. It's the obvious answer. Keep an eye on each other, as always.
Oh, is it? Who do you think it is? I said five o'clock. It's three minutes to. Your omelette's on the table. Well, come back when I'm ready to eat it. On time. What? I've left home now. Then you'll have to wait your rush. Lovely to see you, Louis. Evening. Hurry up, omelette. It'll be congealed. Good, is it? Oh, the usual murder and mayhem. <coughs> it's no good, I can't eat it. Can't eat what? The omelette. What omelette? Cheese, bloody omelette. My stomach. Swelling. My lingering pain. Oh dear. God, this atrocious farting is truly foul. Manners? Oh, I'm in purgatory. Oh, my boy, my poor boy. The pain never stops. It's worse than anything I can remember. The doctor, he mentioned some kind of operation. Operation? He mentioned some time after the 25th of April. What sort of operation? A knife in the belly. Open up my gut. Will it work? Well, even if it don't work, I can't be any worse than I am at the moment, can I? I expect not. <sighs> Eat your omelette, darling, before it gets cold. of people on about Joe's death. Everyone phoning and asking the same thing. Why? I think the motive was Halliwell loved Joe. Halliwell felt that something very big and important threatened that love. He couldn't kill that, so he killed Joe Alton. This is the only thing that makes any sense. If there is any sense in murder. The whole mess that is existence and mundane things is shot through and transformed by redemption. This is what Jesus meant about redemption. It's the only way. One real act of love. Please let me be capable of it. Give me one chance, and don't let me be a moral coward. Amen. Jeans, Jeremy. New Sparks boy, Alfie. Well, he certainly knows how to tweak a light bulb, doesn't he? <laughs> Think you're going to be a fan of mine, aren't you? 
such outspokenness. Right, front well, door, please. 16 mil camera. Really? Well, I'm like that, me. Forward. You've got quite a few fans on this unit already. Charlie Audrey, for one. Thank you. He buys you chocolates, I believe. Not my type. Six yards. I think you're in there, Kenny. You think so? <laughs> oh. He's 27, unmarried, and he lives in Catford. Oof, what a honey. Oh. Well, you've either got it, dear, or you haven't. <laughs> Thank goodness my Kenny's not like that. Like what? Well, you know. Sad, isn't it? Is it? Mark Kenny, he, he's not a homosexual. No, he's a, um, no, what's he call it? He's asexual, yeah, that's it. No, he don't do anything mucky. He's a very clean living boy. I've certainly gone off him. Seems extraordinary now that I was even bothered. He's an ignorant lout, and that's all there is to it. Such lewd behaviour. To think I used to think you were a great dish. And got an erection when I was near you. And now it's all died completely. So there! Good job it was only a mental affair. Yes. Still the heartache. Bottoms up. Well, the bum was a joke yesterday, I can tell you. And after the barrel motion, I thought I should go demented or something. And we all know why, don't we? Fiddling about. But, thank goodness, after the ointment and the suppository I shoved up in, things have finally quietened down. I was able to venture into the street today, looking like most pedestrians. Nobody actually screamed out, Got a touch of the farmers, have ya? Farmer Giles, got a touch of the farmers? <laughs> then I said to the chemist, I'm warning you, girl, be careful. There's enough talcum powder up there that if I blow off, everyone will be covered in dust. <laughs> And she said quite curtly, I thought, rather you than me, and rang up the pill. <laughs> Have you tried milk of magnesia for it, dear? Do you mind, Joan? I'm talking here. Oh, listen to her. I can't get a word in her I swear I was also something, anyway. To cut a long story short, I tried something new this morning. Put some of that Johnson's foot powder up there. Can't do any more harm, can it, eh? Let's see how that affects it, eh, Joan? Eh? Oh, dear. <laughs> Penny, for your thoughts. The reason for most of the smut in this world is boredom, isn't it, Joan? Is it? Yes. People like to attribute it to reasons more profound, but in my opinion, it's people's conceit that seeks profundity in reasons for behaviour. Don't you think? I wouldn't know. I'm not that bright. Bad day, was it? I always have a bad day performing in such crapola. <laughs> When I think of the shameless way I behave in these studios, dirty minds, the dirty songs, the obscene dialogue, and... The crowds that gather round you like a family. Marry me, Joan. What? Oh, there'll be nothing messy, just friendship, companionship. You've got your mother for that, Kenny. Yes, and you both get on, don't you? 
I need a little bit more than that, lovey. What else is there? I haven't given up hope yet, you know. I'm only 43. 45. Where there's life, there's hope. Besides, it wouldn't work out, would it? You'd never be able to accept my tights drip drying in your sink, would you? I might. You wouldn't. You grow to hate me with all my female paraphernalia on show. Perhaps you're right. I know I'm right. I can read you like a book, Kenny. A love story, am I? A love story. You've got a spastic colon. You make it sound like I've won the lottery. <laughs> Intimate life? He told me he'd keep his eye on it. I told him everything about my predicaments. He said I should find a suitable companion to share my life with, not to worry. You don't have to go too far, Mr. Williams. A little shared mutual masturbation won't hurt you. Well, I thank you for your professional advice, Doctor. Good. Mind you, better to find someone older than yourself, not someone who's after your money. Mm, quite. Charming. I sat alone in the park, thinking of likely lovers. but not a type entered my head. Lovely day for it, don't you think? A walk in the park. Oh, lovely. <laughs> Trace romantic. <laughs> All this excrement is a disgrace. Oh, what can you say at the end of the day? Was the plot so sound or the lines profound? Was there rather less grain than chaff? Oh, what can you say at the end of the day? You can say you made them laugh. The essence of being funny is confidence, a buoyancy. My role in life is played out totally without credibility and so, of course, one falls back on personality playing and all the same old Tired tricks. <laughs> the press call seems to be going very well. Uh, we seem to have got away with it again. What you're playing in this film? I played the part of Thomas Cromwell, privy seal to King Henry VIII and protector of the crown jewels. <laughs> Mr. Williams, could I have another word? You may. What are you doing? Uh, continually appearing in these sort of films. Having a bloody good time, dear. <laughs> I beg pardon. Uh, why are you continually associated with this chamber pot kind of comedy? Well, in our society there was and always should be room for all kinds of entertainment, if it works, on its own level and that the only charge that would be taken seriously by us would be the one that the comedy, the burlesque in this case, didn't work, that it wasn't funny, don't you think? Indubitably, Kenny. Well, that's my point. I mean, is your kind of comedy still funny? I sometimes feel I'm yeah. so useless. I'm slowly splintering as a personality. I feel as though I'm stuck together with stamp paper. <laughs> Kenneth, it's your turn to begin. The subject, stiff upper lip. You have 60 seconds as usual, and your time starts now. I have actually tried this myself at home, and one evidently comes to resemble a ventriloquist's dummy. <laughs> Underneath the lamplight, beneath the barrack door. Mm. 
Kenneth, you've been challenged. Who challenged me? Clement Freud. <gasps> but I'm finished, you great nit. I'm supposed to discuss it, you great fool. Oh, interrupting me before I've even started. Oh, dear. I think my star is on the wane. While all around me the rubbish proliferates. But you, who left this cat in here? The carry-ons used to be my mainstay. As long as they were there, I never had to worry. Hey ho. I fell to musing on my condition. I can't have sex, because I just can't cope on that level. And so I'm only really left with work. Who is it? Peter. Do you want to go on the television and chat with Michael Parkinson? Certainly not, North Country nit. Will I last out until I'm able to retire? My whole life is trying to make it up to her, trying to erase all the sadness and the loneliness, and only succeeding in making more loneliness, because the nights I don't spend with her serve to emphasize the others, or vice versa. There's no one in the world like my Kenny. Awful dreams of Louis saying goodbye forever. And start to bake a sugar cake. What would I do without you? For you to take, for all the boys to see. Peter Ede's secretary rang. Thames Television, Mavis Nicholson chat show will raise the fee to £100. I said, no. All right. But this is a Pyrrhic victory. It's a comfort to me, Kenneth Williams, to learn that you always keep a diary. Oh, yes. What's the saddest thing when you read them that you find in your diary? That continually occurs in mine. Oh, it's depression. Yeah, it's dreary. Things. What, you mean, like, say, you would want to kill yourself or something like that? Oh, yes. yes. I often put down stuff about suicide and how one would go about it. And what would be the best method and all that kind of thing, you know. Looking back on it, of course, it's often quite, you know, quite amusing. Why do you think you want to kill yourself? Well, one would think it at the time because of an extremely low state of morale. And so one does actually write something down about what's practical in terms of how one should go about it. But after all, one tries to remain cheerful. Doesn't <laughs> He's been described as everything from an angry dowager to a wasp with adenoids. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the one and only Mr. Kenneth Williams. stinking play in the first place. I'm sick to death of your complaints, Kenneth. You complain about the production, you complain about the cast, you complain about the lines, you complain about every bloody thing. When you're in a long run, Peter, the play lives with you, day and night. And if the conditions under which you perform are continually frustrating, then it ends in driving you to dementia and a nervous breakdown. Have you seen the Larry Grayson show? No. A complete crib of your act. 
Really? And John Inman's doing the same thing on the BBC. They're finding other people to do what you do, Kenneth. And cheaper, in every sense. Nevertheless, you must realize you're not as unique as you once were. Problem is, Kenneth, it's got about how difficult it is to fit you into a company. People find you a bit of a problem. Peculiar way. No! Oh, the pennies finally dropped for them, is it? I've never bloody fitted in, Peter, have I? I've always been bloody peculiar. Strung out on a limb. That's what makes me so grotesque! I feel quite peaceful and unworried. It is odd. One minute I'm thinking I'll never act again, and then I don't bother about it at all. Tomorrow, a voiceover for Unigate Milk. I've had a terrible shock. I just met. Louis in the street, and she said, excuse me, I know your face. What's your name? She didn't recognise me. Oh, is that all? That happens all the time. What are you doing not recognising Joni? Joni? Lifelong friend. My skirt's too tight. What's the matter with her? I'm giving it to the maid. Don't worry, it'll pass. Thanks, Joan. Peter Ede phoned with yet another big television commercial. Breathe in. He has mentioned not only Brook Bond, Rumbelows and Creeder. And out. But also Timex watches, the post office and Cinzano. Yesterday was PG Tips. David Frost type voice, dubbing a chimpanzee. Well, Doctor, what would you have me do? Eat bland, mushy foods and chew well. I remember thinking as I lay in bed, I am falling, I am falling. All my life has been the process of falling. I know what Stevie Smith meant. They all think I'm waving, but I'm drowning. My whole career has been the waving. I was going to call it Chronicle and Cult, because I am a cult figure. I've been eating it myself for years, just living off body fat. And people say, all he does now is go on and tell those old stories we've all heard before, with his usual lavatory gags and camp blether. Pathetic. The feeling is of a clamp under the heart, and there is sweating. <laughs> and they've owned another lesbian restaurant. Lebanese. Yes, they're all over the place now. Everybody's at it. Lebanese, you silly cow. You be sorry you spoke like that to me when I'm not here. What do you mean, when you're not here? When I'm gone. Dead. You know I care for you, don't you, Lou? As I care for no one else in the world. Pass the batter. That's the reason I'm totally uninhibited when I'm talking to you. I can say what I like. I can be myself with you. Almost. Oh, 
You've never given me a kiss. You've never come up to the guards' room where I sleep. I'm afraid the gastroscopy shows there is an ulcer, a huge ulcer, in the same place. What you've got to decide is whether you can go on taking the pills or have the operation. Operation? Yes. You've got to remember having the operation is important. The timing of the operation is crucial. After all, you're no spring chicken. I'm doing I'm brewing the tea. How did that get in there? If this situation of loneliness and despair persists, I will have to do either pantomime or summer season. Could be nice. What time are you stopping till? Oh, I'm not stopping. Oh, I'm going to be left on my own again tonight then. You'll be fine, Lou. I've marked up your radio time. They've been now done. I'll switch your electric blanket on, shall I? I'll never notice. No? I'm always cold nowadays. My feet and bum don't register anything. Yes, that's true. What time would you like your tea? Oh, I've had my cup of tea. In the morning. When will I fetch you a tea? Let's play it by ear. Good night, Lou. Good night. I love you. I love you. Kenny? Have I got any sugar left? You're sweet enough. <laughs> Flatterer. Good night. Good night, son. I've very little time for illness. I don't mind about dying, not at all. But I'm frightened to death about pain. I have a secret contempt for all weakness, including my own. Goodbye. 
could have waited for me. Fickle. Had meal with Louis at 5.30. Saw the news. Watched dreary saga of murder and mayhem. By 6.30, the pain in the back was pulsating as never done before. So these, plus the stomach trouble, combines to torture me. Oh, what's the bloody point? Oh, what's the Bloody point. was found dead from an overdose of barbiturates Thursday, 14th of April, 1988. The coroner asked, Could the pills have been taken accidentally? The doctor replied, It is possible, but not likely. The coroner recorded an open verdict. <laughs> Next tonight, BBC Four's medieval season continues with The Saint and the Hanged Man. Stay with us. The highs and 